just um, to introduce myself properly, I'm the International Sales and Marketing Director of Gran Bazan and our Rioja Estate Bodegas by Gorri. Uh, but of course, the clear focus here is Gran Bazan today. And uh, together with me, there's Diego Rios, our winemaker, who is going to do the uh, biggest part of, part of the talking, um, as I'm just doing the introduction and the background and stuff, and then letting the really important people do the talking. Um, as I mentioned, uh, let me just give you a brief background on Gran Bazan as an estate, so historical background, and uh, then I pass over the word to Diego so he can get into more technical details about uh, vineyards, uh, winemaking, vintage 2019, and the new wines especially. Good. Um, just for those that never had the ch have had the chance to be uh, in Galicia, um, just briefly showing the location of Galicia, just north of Portugal, northwestern Spain, and Gran Bazan actually is located just between the cities of Santiago de Compostela and Vigo, and between the villages of Villa Garcia and Cambados, rather close to the Atlantic Ocean. So this is just the entrance to the estate, which already reflects somehow the uniqueness of the whole setting. Um, Gran Bazan as a winery is relatively young in general terms, relatively old in terms of Rias Baixas, uh, founded in 1981 by Manuel Ortero. And it was actually a, one of the founding members and co-initiator of the idea of Rias Baixas. So Rias Baixas was starting to, as an appellation in the beginning of the 1980s, being formally founded as a DO late in 1991. So Gran Bazan was one of the first wineries to be there setting actually what the, the rules for what we now today now know as uh, DO Rias Baixas. Um, founded in 1981 by a very eccentric and eclectic person, Manuel Ortero. He was an owner and producer of uh, canned seafood actually before that. And he started Gran Bazan with a very clear and uh, precise idea and approach of producing a state grown premium Alvarino. Um, an eccentric and eclectic pers person that is rather reflected in this magnificent, magnificent um, winery building that looks older than it actually is because it was built in 90, early 1980s. But uh, parts of the facade, especially the, uh, the exterior stone stonework is actually um, coming from an existing palace or an old palace close to the city of Pontevedra. But what about the structure of the building and all the uh, technical equipment? It's really from the 1980s. It just look, looks from outside that's neoclassical. Um, the interior of the building as well is very, very beautiful. There are some very beautiful rooms with very, very elegant detailed woodwork and it shows actually the love of uh, Manuel Otero for the beautiful things in life. Um, this eccentricity of Manuel Otero is as well reflected in the, you all know them, uh, the very special labels of Gran Bazan and the unique label design which is by the way, uh, the bottle design which is by the way designed from Manuel Otero himself. And uh, if you have had the chance to visit the winery, you must have seen tons of different labels from each of the brands, because uh, in some years he had a label designer in his payroll. So what nowadays would be, of course, a no-go to change the label for each vintage. He actually did it. So he wanted a new, newly designed label. And this label designer actually was an artist. So there are wonderful pictures and of the images of the, the winery building and the vineyard displaying on different models. Um, so that was kind of his idea of how to manage the business. Um, but nevertheless, he was really driven by uh, the idea of growing grapes and producing the best Albarinos possible. 
and uh, thanks to him, we actually have this unique vineyard that is surrounding the winery building, what we call Finca Tremoedo. And uh, it's interesting that in a rather underdeveloped area, as it was Rias Baixas in the late 1970s, early 1980s, he actually hired an agronomist uh, with the name of Jesus Requena, um, who should find out the best spot, the best location for creating a vineyard suitable to produce, produce the best grapes possible. That is now the Finca Tremoide, which is uh, approximately uh, one mile away from the shore of the Atlantic Ocean and has a size of 35 acres. More details to this vineyard will be provided to you by Diego later on. Um, I will just wanted to point out that the size of this uh, vineyard is rather unique in uh, Rias Baixa, especially in the Val do Sanes area, uh, because it's one of the largest vineyards in one piece, 35 acres, in comparison to an average size of vineyards that is below one acre. And of course, you can easily understand the advantages of having uh, the vineyard, one vineyard in one piece just outside of your cellar door in terms of short work path and just uh, having proper control of the vineyard, the grapes, just outside the door. Um, this vineyard was planted in the traditional pergola system, so in a high trellis system that we call parra. The advantages and disadvantages, we'll tell you, uh, Diego will tell you more about it. And the soil is a decomposed sandai granite soil, which uh, provides both um, good water drainage and good water storage capacities in general. So on one hand, he was eccentric and eclectic, but he really understood and uh, uh, knew what he wanted and what he needed to achieve to produce the best quality possible. There was one on one hand, the vineyard, and on the other hand, uh, the winemaking. And in terms of winemaking, uh, Gran Bazan really is a pioneer in, in Rias Baixas. Uh, first, when it comes to using long skin contacts or long cold soak, uh, we dispose of particular macerators where we can actually um, do a long, long skin contact at control temperature to extract flavor information out of the grape skins. Um, experimenting with surly aging. So our Etiqueta Ambar was one of the first surly aged Albarinos. And uh, becoming actually a cult wine in the end of the 1980s, the beginning of the 1990s among sommeliers in all over Spain. Um, being used to an Albarino style that is rather just fresh and fruit driven, acidic in most cases, and now having uh, um, a wine with uh, surely aging of over six months that is providing the pellets with creaminess, structure, length, and of course giving the wine a longer life. So the amber, as it is today, was always an example of an Albarino that can formidably age in bottle. So uh, the hype for the amber was uh, that prominent that there are stories in Galicia uh, of trucks from nationwide distributors queuing around the uh, finca, the bottling day of amber, just to really be sure to get a part to get their share of the bottles. So that was the late 1980s, the early 1990s, when Gran Bazan was really on the top among the best white wines in Spain. And another example for another first is the uh, Limousine, which is uh, one of the first Albarinos actually to be aged in oak. And uh, Sometimes I'm kidding that the label design and uh, the rather, for most people, ugly frosted bottle has never been changed since 1985, which was the first vintage of that wine. So summing up, 
uh, what, when it comes to winemaking, Ranbathan really created lots of firsts and was a pioneer in lots of technical uh, approaches that never had been done before in in uh, in the Dias Baixas without losing a very traditional style of Albarino and just setting new limits for, for this idea. Um, other projects of Manuel Ortero, um, joint ventures in Chile, uh, a winery that never produced wine in Requena in Valencia, and the already legendary largest Albarino plantation in the United States, in New Jersey, that never gave fruit, were kind of reasons for um, a certain deterioration of the winery because they were consuming lots of attention and time, as you can understand. And all this came together with uh, a certain deterioration of the uh, health conditions of Manuel. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and uh, during the early 2010 years, he was starting to look for somebody who would, might be interested, first of all, maybe investing in the winery or acquiring the winery, but uh, to reassure the, um, the continuity of his legacy. Um, in 2017, finally, uh, the um, acquis so he sold the winery in 2017, and it was acquired by uh, Pedro Martinez, the owner of uh, Bodegas by Gorri in Rioja, a man that promised Manuel Ortero to really fulfill his legacy, and especially in terms of quality, being a person that is obsessed with quality and uh, details. Um, Pedro Martinez is, uh, was professor for biochemistry at the University of Murcia, dean for the Institute of Biology at the University of, of Murcia, is one of the most renowned experts nationwide for clinical chemistry, vice president of the Spanish Chamber of Pharmacists, honor, honorary president of the Royal Academy of Medicines in Spain. So a uh, scientist that it actually dedicates all his forces for improving quality. That's all he wants. He's a person of uh, 73 years by now, but he's really still try, uh, traveling back and forth to Galicia, back to Murcia where he lives, to Rioja, back to Murcia where he lives, this often twice a month. Um, with the acquisition of Gran Bazán by Pedro Martinez, uh, there were certain investments done to actually reform the structure of the winery and uh, be able to continuing uh, the improvement of uh, the quality. I'll just show you a picture of um, a new underground cellar uh, for the fermentation and aging of particulates and oak barrels, small oak barrels, so 250, 225 liter barrels, 600 liter barrels, and even fooder barrels. Um, in the same cellar, there's a new project we started last year, uh, the first sparkling Albarino. And you can see as well that we are building up a library uh, to show the verticality of the Gran Bazan wines which shows uh, in some cases really surprisingly well. Uh, I saw just before that when Ellen was there, I saw him just a moment, but Ellen shared a moment uh, when he visited Gran Bazan, when we opened uh, an amber from 1992 that was just showing amazingly well. Uh, Next to this, uh, we in generally uh, made certain reorganization of the whole cellar in terms of uh, improving the bottling, uh, reducing tank volume, not to talk about new floor, new ceiling, um, created another separate cellar for uh, fermentations, smaller scale in stainless steel tanks. So creating conditions that would be help us to continuously improve quality of the wines and not just improve them, but uh, gaining more character, more authenticity uh, in a general way. 
Um, again, we changed the um, the winery shop, so creating new spaces within the winery that would be interesting for events, wine tours, and etc., which is a kind of a recipe that worked fairly well at our Rioja estate, which is one of the most visited wineries in all over Spain. Um, the Gran Bazan has a wonderful bank, banquet room for 300 people for weddings, parties, and whatever. So this part as well is it has been reformed and uh, is going to be an important pillar of the business as well. Um, another new project that we are starting now is uh, in terms of reducing the carbon footprint. Um, most of the lights within the winery has been um, turned to LED lights. Uh, we gain most of the energies through solar panels maybe you have seen already uh, those that have had access to the new warehouse in jersey they might have seen it that we changed the the wine boxes now they are made of uh, recyclable materials and um, in addition something you guys love very much in the united states that's the green plastic cord for, for the etiqueta verde for some markets we are replacing it and using an alternative cork made by sugar cane, so made of re recycled, already mis recycled materials and uh, being a material that is 100% biodegradable. Not to speak about that the wines are, all wines are vegan and yeah, much more changes and improve, improvements to come. Yet again, uh, all these investments in infrastructure in uh, the cellar are important, but most important, of course, is uh, uh, the human team. And uh, I think the most important, let's call it acquisition, was uh, Diego Rios, our winemaker. Uh, and I'm going to pass the word to him just in a moment. Just, just let me introduce him. I met Diego the first time, I think it's already almost seven years ago when we were actually uh, looking in the uh, Mosul and Sar Valley for a white wine winery that finally became Grand Bazan. But at those times we were actually looking into a German estate and we met Diego at the winery he was working then as a winemaker at the VDP estate uh, Weingutheimer Löwenstein in the upper Mosul Valley. And um, I think it was love at the first sight between Diego and Pedro. And uh, we kind of never uh, lost contact. And uh, at the end, Diego was able to join Gran Bazan in May 20, uh, 2019. Diego is actually Chilean, but has been living in Germany quite for quite a while. He's fluent in English, German, Spanish, of course and uh, having studied enology at the University of Santiago de Chile and uh, gained experiences in very renowned houses like Montes in Chile, Domendrua, Oregon in uh, the United States and finally at Heimann Löwenstein where he was actually responsible to produce some of these amazing Rieslings made by very, very small particular lots in these steep terrace vineyards you have in the upper Mosul Valley. Well, Diego, uh, it's your turn. You can take over. Well, well thanks so much for that introduction. And I'm gonna try to share the screen. Uh, well, my computer is saying that I cannot manage the screen, but yes, I'm gonna ask you to, okay. to move the, sure. the, the slide down. I don't know why it doesn't work, but. So, um, well, yeah, thanks so much. If you go much just to the next slide, uh, that picture, that picture, no, the one, next one, next one, next one uh, after me. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, um, the picture that you get. This is a very classic image of what you get in, in the Rias Vacha. So it's always cloudy, always foggy. We're really close to the coast. So you get that fog coming into the valley almost every morning during the summer. Uh, so that's pretty much the classic thing that you see that you see in the Rias Baixas. Also, if you see in the slide before, 
uh, the upper trellis, the trellis that goes above 1.8 meters, uh, two meters high, that in such a vast extension, uh, Galicia, it might be probably the only place in the world where you have this system. As Matias told before, it is called Parra Gallega. You might know it as well as Pergola, but actually the proper name is Galician Parra, Parra Gallega, and the Galician people are very eager to let you know that that is actually from them. Uh, they're very proud about it. And so, uh, as you can see, there's not actually, not absolutely uh, any canopy management can be made by hand, by machine. Everything has to be made by hand and also the harvest. So all our production is harvested by hand. Uh, the appellation and Rias Vaja doesn't allow any other thing, but uh, it might change in the future. Till now, uh, the only way to harvest the in the Rias Vaja, the only allowed way in order to call it Albariño Rias Bachas has to be made by hand. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much the main picture and you were wondering why, why would you do that? It looks very hard to work with because you have to work with your arms up, right? Matias, if you go to the next one. Uh, so in the next slide, what you're gonna see is I put you over there uh, a couple of information about our uh, climate conditions. You're gonna see that Galicia is a very particular spot in Spain, whether you have in Spain in mind, such as a kind of like a dry area. Well, in Galicia, it's absolutely not. So I put you there, the average annual temperatures uh, for the last 15 years and the last vintage, vintage 2019, and you're gonna see that we move around the 56 uh, Fahrenheit. So pretty mild. You don't get much uh, hot days in the summer, not really cold in the winter, uh, because we're really close to the sea. So there are vineyards are most of them not farther than actually all the vineyards that, that are right next to the winery were not farther away than 1.3 miles from the actual Atlantic Sea. And that has a lot of, a lot, uh, a lot to do and has a lot to say uh, in the profile of our wines. But what I think is the most remarkable feature about this area is the average annual rainfall. If you see over there, I put you the average in the last 15, uh, the last 50 years, 1,300 uh, millimeters. And for the lab vintage, there was 1,440 millimeters a year. But if you see in the diagram right uh, on the right, you're gonna see that probably 80% of, uh, of the areas where our vines are being cultivated is in that purple bluish area. So actually you're gonna see over there that we're closest to the 2,000 millimeters a year. And to tell you something that you might be more related to that millimeters a year, that would be twice Seattle. So it's, it's a lot of rain. It's actually twice Seattle because Seattle will be around 900 a year. So uh, you have a lot of humidity. Ergo, you have a lot of pressure from fungal diseases. So the answer or the know-how, how it evolved in this area is was to go higher uh, with the vines. Uh, for two main reasons, or because you have two main problems. One will be fungal diseases, pressure from fungal diseases. So you have to go up in order to let the wind blows in and dry the grapes whenever it's raining during the summer or during the growing season. Um, and, the second of all, and the second of all, and probably one of the most important ones, with, with this pressure of rainfall, you had a lot of soil loss. So the water kind of like washes the soil out. So you have to keep this green cover that you see on the picture. Uh, this, grow, this green cover maintains the structure of the soil, but the green cover also maintains the humidity. It's very humid in the, in the area nearby. So that's why if you keep the grapes close to this, this green cover, at the end of the season, the only thing that you're gonna get is botrytis. Uh, so in order to, if you want to go for healthy grapes, which is actually the goal from everybody, you have to go up. So that's pretty much the same, the same we have this system around in more than 98% of, of all the surface where we get the grapes from. Um, so it's the know-how of the area and, and makes also the landscape of the area uh, very particular and very unique. Matthias, please uh, go two slides uh, to the, to the uh, vineyard slide, please. So uh, in order to explain you how our production system, system works, um, so the winery owns 15 acres, will be, as Matthias says, around 35, uh, a little bit less than the 35 acres. And, yeah. and those are uh, uh, um, vineyards that the, that, the fan, that the winery manage with the technicians, including myself, from the winery. 
and we go up to another 150 acres, another 60 hectares from what we call uh, a Galician small scale agriculture, which is also very particular from this area. Uh, what does it mean? We work with another around 80 families and each family has around maybe one hectare or even less than that. Uh, and we are lucky enough to say that we have the same contract with these people for over 30 years. It's a very long story with them. And these, all these families uh, that live actually, with, with this, most of them uh, um, are already retired people that live actually from the small scale agriculture. So we uh, support them and we consult them through the whole season uh, in order to achieve the best quality. So it's a very close relationship. Uh, between them and the technicians from the winery. I'm new in the story. As Matthias told you, I arrived in 19, so actually I'm quite new in the story, but I'm getting to know them very well. And we work actually very uh, side by side. And all these producers, uh, uh, let's say, that are scattered in all the five sub population within the Rias Vaiches, but all of them are concentrated mostly, I would say more than 80% of them are concentrated right next to the winery that will be the um, Salnes Valley. Uh, so, uh, uh, Matthias told a little bit about the soil, so in, uh, uh, to paint you the picture, what was the situation as I arrived, uh, when, uh, uh, when you try to find out or, or to go deeper about uh, what's the characteristic of the soil in this area, the main information that you, that you get is, is, is a decomposed sandy granitic soil. That's the most common soil that you find within the Rias Vaiches. There's another three spots in the Appalachian where you get uh, a soil that is uh, uh, being formed by a different type of, uh, of stone formation. I will, I'm talking about metamorphic stone. It's a stone that is, is product from sedimentation, sedimentation and, and pressure. I'm talking about slate and schist. Way different uh, origin than granite. And granite, what you have is, is, is uh, being formed by the very slow cooling down the magma. So completely different story, but where main are vineyards are being cultivated is over sandy granitic soil. And when I try to go deeper in this, in this information, there's very little, there's very little uh, research about it. Uh, so I have to jump in it full time uh, because uh, as you might know or not, uh, there's around different 30 different type of um, uh, granitic stones and also at the different levels of decomposition of the granitic stones. So actually the variety that you might have and that you might find in this, in this, um, in this area, it might be quite rich, but there's very little that you can go to books to find out. So in order to approach this to uh, the wines or the concept of the wild was uh, because of my background in Riesling and in the Mosul River, uh, I'm, very, I'm very close to it. Uh, so then the way to approach it was uh, two different ways, I guess. One, it was to start digging holes and see what's there. And if you have uh, like in the neighbor, in the neighbor uh, hole, it's a completely different uh, story. But what you do is to vinificate those uh, two different, uh, two plots uh, separated in order to see what you get from it. Uh, but we didn't have time for that. I arrived in May, vintage was in September. So there was very little time to do all that research. That's actually what I'm doing right now or what I was doing before the old Corona crisis. But um, as, a, as, a, as a second, as a second period of research of, of what we have there in our vineyards. So what I had to do, what I dedicated all my time in that period, it was to uh, organize these 80 families uh, regarding to the place where they were growing the grapes um, to, in order to have uh, days of harvest where the grapes were coming from, from, from just one area and vinificate those separately which you might uh, think sound really obvious what you have to do, but actually it was quite a good job because we're talking about 80 families, um, uh, countryside families that are really hard to organize and kind of like to understand where are we heading, but they were very cooperative. And uh, at the very end of this story, we were able to vinificate separately uh, grapes coming or other and you're coming from at least six different areas, most of them within the Salnes Valley and, and that added all the different modifications that we did within our plots, within the, the, the vineyards that we manage ourselves. So I had a wide range of uh, Alvarinos vinificated from different areas and the results were actually for me uh, really uh, uh, mind blowing. The, the differences or the, or the ability of this grape to imprint something very particular regarding to the terroir 
in, mo in most cases, it might be a slightly different, but, but very, very easy to differentiate one from another. And in other ones, and, and other ones the difference was actually uh, very there, very evident. So later on, when we have to decide uh, the final QV, what's going to go into Etiqueta Verde and what's going to go into Etiqueta Ambar, the mapping uh, on the features of the different uh, uh, batches, it was actually very obvious and made our job very easy in terms of differentiating the, the quality on the best spots. If you see that uh, woods, that woods on the right side after the after the um, uh, after the road, where you're gonna see over there is like a uh, it's a wood over there, and this is our new project, which is a little bit higher than uh, the rest of our of our plots, and that's gonna be planted this year, and we are very happy to have this project going on because it's something that I that I'm me as a new winemaker, I can build from scratch. And, and, and to have a very accurate uh, picture of, 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 of what it's going to be and the idea that we want to do. Uh, so uh, that means that the, the surface that we're going to manage by the end of this year is going to be around 20 hectares owned by the winery. So Mattia, can you go to the vintages of an So uh, what I wanted to tell you about this vintage, is, uh, which is my first vintage in the winery, uh, is uh, uh, well, a completely different vintage. Uh, we have in 2019 uh, very good quality uh, and it's probably in, in 18 uh, happened probably what you were expecting to happen with this all uh, global warming. Theoretically, what you're going to get is probably or what you're expecting to get is uh, lower, lower uh, acidity levels and higher alcohol. And that's kind of like it happened in 17 and kind of happened in 19, not being critical though. But, but it was kind of like heading that direction. So we were totally expecting that for 19. And at the very end, we got quite the opposite. And what we got in, a, in 19, uh, it was uh, actually very, very high alcohol, kind of like on the boarding on the critical. We were very worried before the vintage that it was around the 12 grams per liter uh, and then 11 grams per liter, still being very high. Uh, and But the alcohol likely uh, it maintains. It didn't went really, really up. So um, it's completely, totally the opposite that you were expecting uh, of a vintage. Uh, a vintage this is the daughter of the new, of, of, the, of, of, the, of the way of the uh, global warming making its way through. So actually what is gonna happen in the future, um, nobody knows and I have no certainty whatsoever. Um, but so that's what the main features of 19 was. On the other hand, it was a very little vintage. Why? Because we had a lot of rain during the spring we had a, a lot of rain during the blossoming. And this uh, replicate, you know, pollen is a dust. So if it is wet, it doesn't fly. So you get less fruit set. So we were expecting already less fruit. And then during the whole flower, after the flowering season, we got really cold temperatures. So you had less fructification of berries. And two weeks, I guess, uh, the rest of this is so went quite all right. But two weeks before the harvest, or, or three weeks before the harvest, we have this warm wind coming from the north. Uh, which actually it was it's so warm that you lose weight on the on the on the bunches you lose water from the grapes. So one head you get very concentrated grapes, and in terms of quality, it's actually quite uh, outstanding. But on the other hand, you get less uh, kilograms per hectare. Uh, so at the very end, we had at least thirty percent less than two thousand and eighteen, which uh, what well, hurts a little bit. On the other side, in terms of quality, it was for me as my fellow vintage helped me a lot, and uh, and I think. Uh, this little vintage helped me to do everything that I had planned before. Um, in terms of logistic for me, it was, uh, was quite easy and, and everything worked out very well. So we were very happy about that. So um, this is pretty, pretty much the, the average feature of 19. You have very concentrated, highly concentrated uh, grapes, high acidity, uh, um, very low yield. And I will say um, the wines after fermentation were already very, very showing very wines, so very uh, like uh, uh, like this concentration get married, like a lot of palate, a lot of personality in the nose. So well, in terms of quality, we were very very happy. Just the numbers were a little bit not quite what we were expecting, but, but we're still happy about that. So uh, talking about this and jumping already into the wine, uh, uh, the first wine that we're gonna have, I'm gonna walk through. I want to walk you through uh, the four wines um, of our of our uh, portfolio, starting with Gran Bassan Etiqueta Verde, which is this label you might, might be already related to. 
This is 2019. Um, uh, so uh, Etiqueta Verde is um, our entry level wine with the classic style of the Salnes Valley. And why do we refer, what, what is actually what that means? Uh, so uh, within the Rias Baixas, you have five different sub appellations and Salnes Valley is the one that has the, the, the longest coast or said the longest and mass of earth all, along the coast. So you have the influence, the direct influence of the Atlantic Ocean, and you have this in this wine. That means this is, is uh, uh, from the wines that we're going to have today, it's the youngest version of our Alvarinos. And what you have in the nose, you have the primary fruit there. There's a lot of the grape variety in this wine. You have the citrus, you have the, you have the, uh, the pear, you have the honeydew, um, you have that slight herbal and also slight flowery notes uh, uh, on the nose. But, what, what I think is the most remarkable about this wine is it still leave room to showcase what, what it is for, for me, what it represents for me uh, a sandy granitic soil wine. And I think in this wine, uh, it's very well interpreted. What, what normally what granitic soil gives you is that, is that uh, direction of the wine. It's a, very, it's a wine that is very straightforward. There's no more horizontal as a vector in this wine. What you get is a very filigranate, straightforward wine. Um, and I think it's, that's very well represented. It's, as the granitic soil has a little bit more clay, you get that really slight and fine verticality about this wine. In our case, well, in our, in our case what we have is more on the sandy uh, 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 side, a uh, granitic sandy. So what we get there is a wine that is very there. It's very straightforward, very, uh, very honest. Uh, you have that uh, slight saltiness and slight metallic flavor I want about this wine that uh, some of you, and it's very correct to name it a uh, minerality, there's you to uh, explain what for me represents. It will be, for me, will be this uh, salty, savory aftertaste uh, combined with this slightly metallic flavor. And um, it's the wine that we produce the most. We're around a little bit less than 200,000 bottles from this wine. So let's say this is the, this is the battle horse of the, of the house. Uh, and it's the wine probably that you find everywhere here, at least in, in, in northern Spain. Uh, what I think about the Sunless Valley and when I think about the Rias Vichas, this is the profile, the wine that, I've get, that, that I get. Very straightforward, very cool on the nose. You have, the, you have much of our barinho going on and you have the salty, the salty um, aftertaste that uh, makes you go very well solo. Uh, but I really enjoy with this wine, uh, the very minimalistic intervention of food. If you had a fish, just put a little bit of salt and pepper on it as, 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 less, as less intervention and less spiciness that you can get into into it and then with this one and with this wine it's gonna go perfectly for me it's actually how i enjoy this wine the most so gran basan etiqueta ambar also 2019 and uh, uh, on a personal note this was for me probably the the toughest challenge of all because uh uh, this is probably the most well-known wine from the winery. It's the, it's, uh, the shield of the winery. Uh, so it was a lot of responsibility into my shoulders to, to keep up with the level and, and the quality of this wine. And so before, uh, the winery has the, the facilities to do maceration and we do maceration in all of our, at least in 2019 we did maceration in all um, of our grapes. Uh, what you have here uh, is also grapes that are being macerated in order to extract their information, to extract that extra palate. Uh, and after fermentation, after that, we decide which batches are going to go into amber and which batches are, are, are going to go into uh, verde. What we do is in this one particularly, we do an active batonage, we do an active movement of the leaves. What we don't do in verde, because we don't want to lose any freshness, and then we don't want to go in verde with a wine that is a, is a, a little bit more... Um, uh, uh, opulent, so speaking, and and this wine, Etiqueta Ambar, is a wine that I, I always have had more information. And mm -hmm. let's say we we do this batonage in order to shield a little bit to the granitic soil and go a little bit more horizontal. It's a wine that has, has always have a lot of muscle, and that's what we're actually we're trying to achieve in this wine. So after the fermentation, after we decide um, what is going to be uh, Ambar because it fits the quality and it fits the profile. Now that we did all the all that research during the vintage actually we have the quite uh, accurate mapping of what is going there uh, and we did have before we did have the spots of higher quality and actually correlated quite well with what we did in 2019 what we do have now is a more accurate system of it um, and this wine should be uh, a, a, a gumbe wine it's a wine without a little bit more information about that muscle 
but you want to go with the batonnage as long as it doesn't get very uh, over opulent. It, it, the one it should be an albariño, it should be refreshing, it should be elegant. Uh, and so it's, it's very tricky, the point. Um, so you have to be very on top of it. Uh, and so, and so there's a lot of work behind this wine and uh, I'm happy to tell you also and to share with you that uh, it totally paid off. Uh, we got, um, uh, not a long ago, I think I went, uh, a long, uh, it was a month ago, we got uh, a very good recognition in Spain, probably one of the best that you can get here in Spain uh, with this wine. Uh, it is the National uh, Tester Association, very important sommeliers, uh, tasting the wine, around 1,500 wines. Uh, on that tasting and we got one of the top 25 uh, and it was just two steel whites so we were one of them in the top 25 from uh, 1500 around 1500 wines not only from spain also from all different parts of the world uh, and from the appellation there was around uh, 70 reference we were the only one in this top 25 so uh well, after the whole work and all this research and all the and all the and all testing and uh, you know and I'm very into it, I totally paid off. So we're very proud to present this one to you um, and these days. And, and, it's, and, and it's what I what I told you before. It's a wine that is a classic Albariño and, and the nose um, is quite different than Verde. I will say it in the nose for me, it showcased more on the tropical, on the tropical fruit. And, and you have this added creaminess, the texture, uh, as, as silkiness in the palate that, that much, uh, I think that it's what the people find and more uh, outstanding about this wine. So this is 2019 uh, Etiqueta Ambar. Uh, starting with our limousine. This is a wine that you might be uh, related to as Matias. Uh, this is limousine 2017, the new release. So as Matias told you before, um, uh, the, the winery has quite a history with Albariños and wood. I might say that nowadays, uh, Alvarinos and wood is kind of—it's also kind of like a controversial thing. There's people here, or some ideas are very, that, that have been uh, um, teaching and, and, and tasting Alvarinos for many, many years. That said, that actually, Alvarino and wood has nothing to do with each other. Other people that said that Alvarino and wood is just genius. Uh, for me personally, I really am thankful that I have this one in the range because it takes you a little bit out what is classic vinification or what is a classic profile of Alvarino and offers you uh, a different product that enables you to, to um, do a completely uh, fo a different food pairing than the rest of the portfolio. This is a wine that you have uh, more, uh, more spicy and smokiness and it's been very subtle. Uh, so it enables you to, to food pairing that with, with, uh, with uh, sauces that are more spicy, even though well, actually with everything. So, uh, uh, it's quite a special thing, so I'm really thankful that I have this in the portfolio because it, it, it is really fun. And moreover, we're not the only one that has Albania and wood. There's a few of them, actually, uh, but we're probably one of the first ones. Uh, actually, before, at the very early 80s, it wasn't allowed. If you, if you had wood in the Albarino, it was rejected by the, by the, by the association that, that you have to pass in order to battle the wine. Till Manuel Otero, the owner of the winery, it uh, was, uh, let's say, part of the world, but ballsy enough to say, okay, this is an, an outstanding wine. Don't you dare to reject this wine. And they have to actually accept it and develop a whole new uh, classification of Albariños that is now called Barrel, barrel Albariños. So what we do with this wine, uh, this is also coming from, this is coming from the Finca Tremojedo, right next to the winery. And what we do is ferment it in a stainless steel, but in the very last third of the fermentation, um, we go with this wine into French oak barrel. We have different sizes. We go from one to, uh, 225 liters to 600. That's actually what also the, 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 the rules say to you. You can go just up till 600 liters. And then the wine uh, finishes the fermentation there and remains on the, on the full lease, at uh, least uh, four months. That's probably the average thing that we have. This is around four to from four till five months. So after the month four, uh, we start tasting the wine and, and decide when to get it out of the barrels. Uh, after that, it remains on the full list also till the moment of the battle. And it will be maybe after a year after this. Uh, so if you try a 15 limousine, we're testing today, this is 17. If you try a 15 uh, and also try, uh, it, uh, taste after the 16 and the 17, you're going to notice there's quite a difference. And I'll say the 15, uh, that's what, uh, uh, under the previous owner. Uh, oak in it. It's a, it's a wine that is very oak dominant. If you, if you try one right now, it's a beautiful wine. It's a standing, it's a gorgeous wine, but it, it, 
it needed time to get there because at the beginning it was very uh, it is it, it shows uh, um, uh, the oak a little bit too much to my personal taste so what we did in 16 before I arrived they shouldn't the, the period of the of the um, of the time in the in the barrels in order to uh, to get a little bit more of the Alvarino out of it. And in 17, actually they did the same and I'm totally following the same path as I, as I think it's, uh, it is, it is uh, very remarkable that you have that smoky, spicy uh, note on this Alvarino, but, but, it should, but it still should be an Alvarino. It still should be refreshing. It still be showcasing the fruit. It still, it, should, it still should be very elegant. And I don't want to taste an Alvarino that it could be a Chardonnay from Casablanca Valley in Chile. Uh, so I guess, um, uh, I think that's that's the line that I'm definitely uh, uh, eager to follow, and but I think it suits my my vision of this wine. Um, so we have here 17. Quite a very good vintage. As I mean, 17, 18, uh, quite a good vintage, and probably we're not going to have in the future any other very bad vintages. I think that that are already in the past, in the 90s, and global warming has made its way through, and probably we're not gonna we're not gonna be um, uh, uh, having those very troubling botrytis vintages anymore, uh, but as, 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 again, as a, who knows at the end uh, what, what's going to happen in the future. But, pro, but 17, very good vintage, uh, a little bit boarding on dry, uh, also was 18, and then uh, we got a little bit of rain before the harvest. That makes it, that makes it a little bit complicated. You had a little bit more uh, botrytis pressure compared to 18, but it's still been very extremely healthy grape. It was actually quite a quite a good vintage. Um, Probably the thing that you were struggling the most on 17, it was, it was a very uh, uh, vintage with uh, kind of like a low acidity, uh, but you still have a lot of it in this wine present. As I'm, I'm, and this one for me, it's not like enough acidity, it's actually very well balanced in the palate. Uh, and, and what I think is uh, the most remarkable thing in this wine is, uh, is, is, is how thick in, in the palate is. It's the one that is completely full bodied. Very, uh, it's still been uh, mouth watering because of the acidity, but you still have a, a whole uh, structure, a whole information in it. Don Alvaro de Bazan, 2015. This is the head of, a, of the portfolio, and this is a wine that we don't do every year. This is uh, a wine that we do just in very exceptional vintages. And what is, what is this wine? Uh, to sum it up, it's just the best selection of the best selection. This is uh, is from the plot right behind the winery. What we have over there is a, a very small hill, and this wine is coming from the top of that hill. Why the top of that hill, and what is so good quality related to the top of this hill? Because as it rains so much, as I told you before, as it rains so much, the water, uh, as we have sandy granitic soils, you know, the water flow or uh, I don't know the word in English, but it goes inside the uh, and, 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 and runs towards the lower spot of the vineyard. So if you see an Alvarino plant, it's a very vigorous plant. So what you wanted to uh, have is a more controlled plant, a plant that is not very expressive on the, vegeta in the uh, vegetative area. And that's why we get in this top of the hill, because it's higher, also extremely healthy grapes. As it is higher, and the, and the plants have less of a, of a water resource, they're kind of like struggling, and it's really easy to see. If you visit the winery during the summer, you're going to see on the top of the hill that the plants are a little bit more contained. The birds are also smaller, smaller cluster. And what we do with this wine is we get the grapes from here. We, we do a longer period of maceration. We go up from 10, 12 hours. And then the wine, just in stainless steel, remains on, on this lease uh, up to two years before bottle. So it's a very minimalistic, very uh, puristic sort of speaking of uh, vinification because we just want to showcase what, what, this, uh, what this plot uh, can bring into the glass. And so um, when I jump in into the story, I said, okay, you know, that sounds, the, the story sounds really amazing. So uh, what I wanted to uh, go deeper in the research is um, if it's actually, we do exactly the same that what we do with these grapes and we do exactly the same what we do with all the grapes from all the pot from our vineyards, it's actually showcasing that amazing difference. So what we did in 19 is we get uh, the grapes from this plot and we get grapes from another plot that we have a little bit farther away uh, along the river where the, where the vines are more close to a water source because it's right next to a river. And we did exactly the same vinification. We did the same kilos. We did the same uh, uh, process, uh, processing of the grapes, uh, same fermentation time. And it's actually, it was everything quite, uh, 
quite the same. And the results, what we get from this uh, little hill and what we get from the other part, it was actually uh, a world of difference and then really easy to understand very there. What we get in this, from this little hill is very particular. So let's say that that makes my job very easy uh, in terms of this wine, but it still uh, has, to, has to be on that note of quality uh, year after year. So that's why that it's not a wine that we're going to do uh, or that we have done every year. So we did in 15. Why 15? Well, uh, you guys that, that are uh, very wine related, I've heard that 15 in Europe in general was actually a very quite outstanding vintage. It's the vintage that everybody's talking about and beautiful wines. Also in the Rias Baixa. So it was the perfect vintage to do it. Quite warm, extremely healthy grapes. I would say probably after 14, there was a, that it was a little bit more of a try this pressure after 14. 15 comes to uh, mark a new, a whole new uh, uh, era of, of vintages in the Rias Vinta and the Rias Vinta, as I told you before, we're, we're not gonna get much of a conflict vintages, hope so, uh, uh, like I'm not gonna on wood, um, uh, because of, of, of how the weather has changed and, and it's very there. It's, I mean, it, global warming, uh, uh, I insist, it's, it's not a clear picture what we're gonna have in the future, but if you compare how the vintage were 15 years ago, it was actually bought in on October and now we're starting the second week of, of September. You can actually see the different difference there. And uh, Rias Vites has been, a, been a, 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 a very extreme weather condition area or wine producing area. You're now, you're gonna see that the wines are bought in like an 18 and 13, five uh, uh, percent alcohol and all the 14 more than in the 12 that might have been 20 years ago. So it's just actually very there. Um, so 15, great vintage, extremely healthy grapes, uh, also uh, a little bit warm. Uh, you have in this wine, you have 13 uh, alcohol and you have a lot of acidity and the acidity is very present. And I think uh, it's, it is for me, it's a very uh, good moment to, trace, to taste this wine. So this wine opens the whole discussion about Albarino and, and aging potential that I guess is kind of, it's quite a topic now and I'll list over there. Um, and I will say uh, for me that I'm coming from a uh, background of white that can age perfectly in the bottle. Uh, Albarino has definitely the potential to do it. Uh, we're tasting, we're I'm trying right now a one that is, is 15 and was bottled in uh, late 17 or at the beginning of the 18, I think it was bottled. And, and for me it's now in his very, in his very best. But the thing is like the, the profile that it shows is completely different of what you're expecting or what people has associated in the mind to Albarino. So you're not, you're not in the very expressive, fruity, um, uh, peachy kind of note. Uh, you're more on the, in, in the evolution of this, of, the, of this wine. So you're more on the coffee, you're more on the toffee, you're more on the tobacco, you're more on the caramel aspect of the white chocolate is what I have in this wine. Uh, which is it, it's, it's, it's a completely different world of Alvarino, but I think slowly people, at least here in Galicia or in, in, in Spain, is changing uh, step by step. Not very fast, not very fast, but people still have the conception of Alvarino being extremely fresh uh, wine of the year, that if you have a one vintage older, you might throw it away because it doesn't work anymore. Uh, but I think it's totally changing. And, and this winery works, or at least the way that we're working uh, is uh, with long-term maceration, longer period on the lease, working with the lease in order to confer to the wine, to give to the wine the ability uh, to, to, um, to age for a longer period of time. Also, the work that we vinificated in 19 and it has been in, uh, done in a couple of years before, is, is not an extremely reductive uh, uh, way not very not extremely isolated from Albarino. Moreover, kind of like in the in the midterms relating to oxygen, because that way everything that could be oxidated later in the bottle is already oxidated. So there's not gonna the wine is not gonna change its profile uh, in that extreme in the bottle. So um, definitely you have aging potential here. Of course, uh, this is a wine that has been two years on the lease and Verde is a wine that has been around four to five months on the lease. So the, the edgy potential of these two wines are quite different, definitely. But here we're tasting a wine that is 2015 and for me it's on its best. I'm very actually eager to find out what it's gonna, what it's gonna showcase, uh, in, I don't know, in a couple of years. But I think for me and looking at for uh, maybe uh, with a very humble but more in International uh, point of view for me, uh, Don Alvaro de Bazan is, 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 a, is, is a wine that can compete 
along with those uh, extremely uh, remarkable Shenong and for, for uh, uh, or uh, uh, Rieslings that have a couple more time in the bottle. This is a wine that internationally is quite a thing, I think, to look at. That's what, what this wine represents for me. And so what's come after 15? Uh, so the next vintage that we're going to release from this wine is 18. Uh, sorry. Uh, and 2018, uh, it was extremely good weather, extremely uh, healthy grapes. And uh, that's where we're going to, that's when I, it's going to be the next release. Probably to be bottled uh, at the end of this year and to give a couple of months in the bottle to be released uh, maybe middle uh, middle of uh, 2021. Um, and definitely 19, uh, uh, not because of me, of course, but just because uh, uh, it was uh, the results that we got in 19 uh, actually were quite, quite nice, what we got with this vintage in terms of this wine. So that's why we uh, are very happy with the results of that wine. It's in, in, and I'm very eager to see how it's going to develop. Diego, may I interrupt you just a second? I yeah, just wanted yeah. to, to share with, with everybody uh, the moment when you showed me the 2019, what is going to be Don Alvaro, uh, oh, a couple okay. of months ago. And uh, for me, that was actually a new dimension of, of, uh, of, for that wine. So um, it was just amazing. So watch out until this, when this wine is going to come on the market in a few years, this is really going to be uh, an amazing step forward uh, for this particular, for this particular wine. Uh, well, thanks so much for that. Um, uh, let's say uh, uh, the future, uh, I don't see it, uh, let's say, because a lot of people has asked uh, in, the, in the couple of months, uh, um, what about reds, for example, in the Rias Vaichens? Uh, and let, to be honest, I don't think, we don't have any project going on in reds. We're concentrated in the thing that, that, that the, the winery is well known for and the, and the winery, what the winery can, uh, can perform the best, which is Albariño. But um, let's say that the reds from Galicia are getting a lot of recognition. And the Rias Vaches still being very little. It's, it's less than 1% of the whole production in the Rias Vaches. So it's very, very little. Uh, what it is permitted for the appellation is just local grape varieties. Um, um, there's a couple of them, I think it's four or five. Uh, but it might be a thing to look at in the future. Uh, I, don't see, I don't see it coming from the near future. I don't see it for the next uh, uh, couple of years. But me personally, I'm very interested into, into those, into kind of like uh, showing the world those locals, red varieties. Um, and it might, it might, I think that, that, might, that, that it might think in the future uh, to, to have reds from the Rias Vitas. Still being very little, very undiscovered. Um, but but the winery, you know, very focused in Albariño, but it might something to look at. I just, just want to say that about that because the question have, have come uh, very often. And also, uh, what about other grape, other white grape varieties um, uh, with us? And that's probably a, a firm no uh, in terms of that actually Albariño is what is very well known. It's, it's a tradition. It uh, speaks about the place and. Uh, and, and it's also, let's say, from all the other white varieties, as beautiful as they are, uh, uh, we really want to concentrate on a more puristic and a more, and a more uh, uh, unique uh, version uh, of, of whites from the Rias Vaita. So, uh, Matthias, you want to add something about the wine? No, nothing. I think that's just fine. I just wanted to ask you if you could just tell us a little more about the sparkling wine project and when we can expect the wine to be on the market. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we started the thing in 2019. That was already, uh, let's say, the, the, the basis one was already done as I arrived. And um, you say, uh, sparkling wine from the Rias Paichas is not something new. It has, been, it has been going on for a couple of years. Uh, there's a winery that actually been very successful with it. And as, as, as you have, uh, you know, the profile of the variety, you, you would say, well, yeah, why not? So. They decided to, to try it and that's why they built a whole chamber of, um, because the thing is that we're, uh, it's very susceptible, we're doing traditional methods, so it's very susceptible, we don't have an underground cellar, so that's why it's very, the cellar is very susceptible to change of temperature, so that's why they built a new chamber with temperature control to do the second fermentation. And we did the tirage, we did it, uh, I think it was, uh, let me remember, it was in November, maybe November last year. 
Uh, so it's, okay. it's just a baby smoking wine or uh, fresh in the dirage. Um, I think what we, the, the, the basis wine, uh, it was quite a bit different what you, what you have here already in the offer of sparkling. Uh, the offer of sparkling are very young, very fruity, very expressive sparkling and we moved more to the more evolved, uh, more, uh, let's say, more, more, more of a vintage uh, kind of a sparkling. But it's still a project that is in Pampers, so we still have it in the uh, on the lease, and it's gonna remain there probably for the next two years. I don't see it going out uh, before 2022, as we don't have any market for it. We're not on a hurry to release this product. Uh, it's a very small production, also. I think we did uh, around 3,000 bottles, uh, so we're not on a rush. We're gonna wait that the one gets uh, what it needs or for us, or at least for me, uh, it, sh it should be like a proper serious uh, product. Uh, so I don't see it going out uh, before 2022, uh, but also very uh, eager to see. Uh, so we did the tirage and I haven't even tried it. I have, we haven't opened any bottle. We know that it already fermented all the way because we test, but uh, I really don't wanna, wanna try it right now in an early stage to make my mind of what, what the product is gonna be. And I, I prefer, I'd rather wait and to see how it's going to behave maybe at the end of this year and, and, and to start doing it. We did, we did the second batch in 2019 and that's in, in its lease in a stainless steel tank. And so it's probably a product that's going to be released to stay to, uh, to probably we're going to start doing this uh, every year. Let's see how it works first. Uh, but the idea is to go is to go uh, with a serious product that goes maybe in a price range a little bit below Kawa uh, uh, to make it more competitive. Uh, but that's, that's kind of like my idea, my fantasy about it. Uh, uh, also, I don't want, really, I don't want that, uh, or I don't see it uh, being in a, like a really, in, in, as I told you before, and that really is expressive, bubbly. Uh, I'm, I totally, what, what I would like to uh, uh, present is more, uh, some more uh, um, maybe a winier taste sparkling with a, with a slide uh, perlage. That would be my, my idea of this wine. So I haven't uh, answered any of the questions that I, that pop out. Uh, Sorry, Diego, there's a few questions, yes, that I can perhaps um, feed back to you. Um, one of them was about um, yeah. the clones. Are, are there several different clones of El Mourinho? About the clones. Yes. You said clones? Yes, clones. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the winery was, uh, the, 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 uh, in terms of clonal selection, the, there's very little in the, the sadly, it's very little uh, done in the Rias Vices. There's not much investigation about it, and there's not much of an offer of different clones. And there's many of the clones that were back in the 80s that are not being longer produced. Anymore at the very beginning in the 80s, what we what, what they did is they a lot as a high yields and lower acidity because that was the the problem back then problem that we don't have right now. And so with the years, uh, the offer of clones that you have right now is very very little. You might have, uh, for for example, for the new plantation that we have, we might get maybe four of them from different areas from different uh, parts. And and the and the and the winery was planted at the uh, at the early 80s with around 12 till 14 uh, different ones, different ones. There's very little information about the features of each one, uh, which which I don't uh, dislike. I I'm, I'm more of a of a polyclonal. Uh, I have a more, more like a polyclonal kind of uh, idea, and more and, and moreover more of as a muscle selection. Uh, I think that it showcased the muscle selection showcased the best how the different clones adapted to that particular conditions there where we are uh, producing the vines. And so I would say like in, in terms of uh, what we produce in Alvarino is it's a polyclonal plantation because we moreover we work with all these other 80 families. So this is a wide range of different clones, but with the years, uh, the production of these clones have gone a little bit down. So there's not much of an offer of clones that you can uh, big right now, and but what it is, we got a couple of them, and we do the new, the new, the new agronomic design for the new plantation from these new five hectares. Okay, and in terms of uh, yeasts, uh, do you use indigenous yeasts or selected yeasts? 
Uh, well, it depends a little bit on the, on the year. Uh, for example, 2019, historically, we do, we do, uh, we use selected yeast. And for example, in 2019, we did uh, uh, trials with uh, spontane fermented, went actually very well. And that we put on the barrels and, and actually were on the, on the limousine level. And definitely very eager to go further with that in the future. As for me, that's a, but that's a personal thing. That for me, uh, uh, it shows, it showcases better uh, how, how expressive it's like if you, if you take it like a cheese from uh, non pasteurized milk, you know, it's a way more expressive explosion of taste. And that's actually what we have this year. Uh, everything that we vinificate, we vinificate with a selected yeast that is neutral. So there's not much uh, enhance of a particular uh, profile. Uh, it's actually very neutral. That's actually what we did in this different uh, uh, vinification of, that we did from different areas, because that's the only way to see actually what the grapes is bringing you to the table. And so, uh, yeah, uh, if it is in the future, everything's gonna be spontane fermented. I don't know, uh, but I would love to. Uh, I think that my experience the last six years in Germany was 100% ferment, uh, spontane fermented um, wines. Um, but I think it's like uh, Grand Bassin has a very distinguishable profile and very well established in the market. And, and, and for me as the, as the newcomer, uh, I don't wanna go extremely out of that because that actually is, is, what, is what it represents the winery. And, and, the, and the problem with spontane fermentation is it might take you a little bit out of it, but, but if it is good, if it is good, if it, if it works, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Good. Um, there was another question about the, um, the climatic conditions of the subzones of, of rare spices and how particular salness is. So salness is obviously you mentioned, you touched on the, the, the fact that it's, it's one of the wettest areas in the, in the DO. Are, yeah. there, are there other distinctive characteristics of, of salness compared to the other um, subzones? Yeah, sure. I mean, you have five different subzones. There's two of them that are right next to the coast. Mm. Uh, the other one that is not Salnes, that is called Orosal, uh, the, the land, the mass of land that is right next to the coast is very little. It goes more like a French inland. And the other ones are also more inland. And Salnes will be the seconds farther north. So the, 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 this thing, also like the, how high it is, North and how close it is to the to the sea um, uh, is what brings you this this profile of wines. Uh, uh, if you go southern, you have Orosal over there, and you have Condaletea, which is the second biggest after Salnes, more inland. So what happens more inland is, is you you are going to have hotter days and colder nights. So the, the temperature get a little bit more extreme. Uh, on the coast, it's more mild and steady. This mild temperatures and enables you to keep this acidity because you know the grapes you do photosynthesis during the day where the sun is up, right? And during the night, if it's if it's warm during the night, you're gonna burn all those acids because during the night the plants do respiration. All the acids that are in the grapes are uh, are part of the respiration of this of the Krebs cycle. Uh, so you're you're gonna be losing that. So what what it keeps this tension and this uh, this crispy acidity on this wine is how close they are to the sea because this is a sub appellation that is. It has, uh, has the longest uh, surface along the coast, and also the second farther north. You have the other one uh, that is up uh, the, the northest, it's called Rivera del Ulla. It's a far northest, but also a little bit more inland. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same characteristic. This is a, uh, that other north, Rivera del Ulla, is also maybe a spot to look at in the future because, if, uh, because it's, we're probably in, I don't know, maybe in 15 years, you're gonna get the ones with the more tension or with the more acidity. Yeah, but, but nowadays I will say, the other parts, for example, if you try Alvarino or more the south, uh, for me will be more uh, um, more on the more, more very well on the fruit expression, mm -hmm. uh, and for me Salnes Valley will be definitely more on the saltiness and, and, and more on the granitic profile, more more more, more as I told you before, mm -hmm. as I described it when you, mm -hmm. uh, of the verde. In terms of the technical aspects of the bottling, do you fine and filter the wines before they're bottled? Uh, we do we do a little bit of very little actually of finding. Uh, we do a little bit uh, uh, for the first release, you know. But, but as a wine that has been longer on the on the on the on the cellar and we have worked with the lease, we don't do any. 
Mm -hmm. And we do uh, cross flow filtration uh, in order to model because uh, there have been some people or friends of mine that are also uh, working white wine and, and they have been comparing the different kind of filtration and on which one the wine recovers faster uh, and has been the cross flow filter. So there's many of the very high end wineries, for example, in Chile uh, that, that are changing to the cross flow filtration. I was lucky enough that I arrived to the winery and I, almost the same day that I arrived to the winery, the new cross flow filter arrived. So in terms of logistics, been uh, wonderful because it, it well the technology in cross flow filtration has evolved a lot so what you have now is kind of like a ferrari of the cross flow filter that works with a very very low pressure with it, for, for the ones that are not related to it the cross flow filter works uh the ones that are right now the ones that we have works exactly as a sift as a, as a sift you know so you have a, a distinguished pour where the wines go dirty and on the other side clean uh, but the pressure uh, which it works is very 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 low so it goes slow it will take you one day to filter a whole a whole batch, but it's very soft with the wine, and we have uh, experience that actually the wine recovers very very good from from it. So I'm very happy to about that. And you have almost none loss of wine. So that's what we do. And of course, before before the bottling, we do an, a 100% sterile filtration with the with the cases. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you very much.